So we're going to take you through what we think are, in our opinion, the more interesting and perhaps more useful findings from Media in Focus. Uh, there's loads more in the book. If you want to download it, you can. You can get it from Amazon. You'll be able to get it as a digital from the IPA later this year, but not just yet. So let me just give you a word about our data sources. We're going to make this evidence-based. In the grand tradition, we're going to try and make this as scientific as we possibly can. So let me just give you a brief intro to the research we're going to be uh, taking you through and, of course, the data that lies behind it. So as, as you now know, Four years ago, we wrote the long and the short of it, which was an attempt really to look at how things were, had been moving forward since we, we um, wrote Marketing the Year of Accountability back in 2007. But it was also the first time that we identified this critical lens through which we need to view effectiveness, which is to say that if we measure success in the short term, we, we unfortunately come to exactly the opposite conclusions about what works best than if we measure success in the long term. Um, and we identified it as a rather dangerous uh, principle in the marketplace because we recognized then that things were beginning to go a whole lot more short term, but we didn't really have any data to see how that was going to play out. Now, hardly had the ink dried on this report and people started saying, yeah, but the rules are changing. This is also out of date. It can't possibly be valid. So here we are four years later with Media in Focus, which is an attempt to very specifically address the issues of the changing media environment, the, or the new developments, particularly in Web 2.0 period, and ascertain exactly what has changed. So Les is going to be talking about other rules changing, and I'm going to be coming back and asking whether people are following those rules um, and um, whether or not we're getting the best out of it. As always, the data that lies behind our analysis is the confidential data submitted to the IPA Effectiveness Awards alongside the case studies that are submitted to the uh, Biennial Effectiveness Awards competition. Uh, so it covers an enormous number of fields, but it's simplistically what it enables us to do is to examine how inputs, such as, say, strategy, or in this instance, particularly media choices, influence outcomes in the sense of hard business effects. It's very, very simple. It's an empirical database. Um, all of the data we're going to be looking at here is digital era data, so we're going to principally be looking at the 500 plus case studies that have been submitted during the digital era, but we're going to be very particularly mining down to the 120 or so cases that have been submitted in the last two awards years, such as to say over the last four years, so that we can specifically answer that question of how things have changed. Uh, so, just before I hand over to Les, I just want to reprise a chart from uh, the long and the short of it, which in many ways is, underlies everything we talk about, and in many ways is perhaps the most important chart that we have produced over the years. Because what it reminds us is that there are actually two ways we can drive sales growth. Um, and I think a lot of people, particularly from a digital background and perhaps from a finance background, forget the most powerful and most potent way of driving sales growth. So this is what I'm going to refer to as brand building. And those, this is absolutely to reiterate and what Rachel and Karen have said about building and reinforcing and strengthening those memory structures. So that is what this is about. Brand building at its best is about creating powerful emotional associations with brands and reinforcing them over time. Um, and as you can see from this chart, the individual steps, the individual uplifts that we get to sales effects from that kind of way of thinking don't tend to be massive. It takes a long time to build a brand, as you will all know. But if we stick at it and we continue to build and reinforce those, those um, memory associations, then over time we can drive year-on-year -year growth. We can drive long-term growth, as long as we stick at it. The trouble is all the excitement and interest in recent years has been around what we, what we refer to as the sales activation model of thinking. This is to say short-term behavioral prompts. Classically, these days, timely and relevant offers, to use that loathsome expression, which I hate so much, go on about. But also, these, these could just be kind of new product news, new product features, rational information. Classically, it could be seasonal prompts and so on and so forth. So they can prompt, if they are powerful, messages, some really quite significant short-term uplifts. If they're promotional messages, certainly they can do this. But as we know, these <coughs> kinds of stimuli tend to decay very quickly. Uh, so they may prompt a big spike, but you know what? It decays very rapidly, either because they're time-limited offers or deals, or simply because these kinds of associations are not very well remembered, and they don't form powerful associations over time. 
We also observed uh, four years ago that if you ever needed proof that Sod's law exists, this is it. And that is that the cusp point, if you like, at which long-term brand building starts to take over as the dominant driver of observable sales effects is around about six months in. It's, it's an average. In some categories, clearly it happens sooner. In others, maybe it happens longer. But as a rough average across the database, there is this unfortunate six months cusp point. So you can see the problem here. If we measure success over the long-term right-hand side of my chart, we come to the conclusion quite rightly that brand building, creating these powerful memory structures, is the best way to drive sales. Absolutely true. Our data entirely supports all of the other data you've already seen. But here's the pain in the butt. If we measure success in the short term, that's to say the left-hand side of this chart, we come to exactly the opposite conclusion that, in fact, these short-term sales activation um, uh, stimuli are, in fact, the best way to drive uplifts. And, of course, you would be right, but only over the short term. You can see it plateaus very rapidly. So quarterly reporting in particular, but all the real time, all the energy that's going into real time uh, marketing, real time campaign management, pushes this right to the left hand side of this chart. It prejudices us to this particular way of thinking. And our big worry is that that doesn't play out in the long term in, in the way that it appears to play out in the short term. In many ways, it's an illusion. So um, that's my intro rant. There'll be more ranting from me. Over to Les to answer the question, are the rules changing? Thanks. So um, as Peter says, what we've been doing recently is revisiting some of our earlier research to see whether the rules seem to be changing over time, and in particular, uh, looking to see whether the last 10 years, this, the sort of Web 2.0 era, is different from the earlier period um, of the sort of Web 1.0 era, um, and whether digital media follow, follow different rules from traditional ones. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is reach. So already this morning, we've heard sort of Rachel talking about the important of, importance of reach for effectiveness, and that's something that was very big in our earlier research. We've always said that effective marketing camp campaigns have got to reach as many people within the category as possible, and that means that broad reach media tend to have an important role to play. So um, what we found is that when we looked at the new data, we find very similar results. We, what we find is that, by and large, reach tends to be more important than targeting. Targeting does have a role to play, as Rachel pointed out, that targeting can do many things. One of the things that targeting can do is to extend reach by reaching um, targeting hard-to-reach individuals, for example. Um, but the data can point you in the wrong direction if you look at the wrong things. In particular, as Peter says, if you look at short-term data, you may reach the wrong conclusions. So, for example, if we look at um, what we call activation effects, that's to say immediate short-term responses, direct responses, clicks, all those sort of immediate uh, short-term measures, then we tend to find that tight targeting will produce a big response in the short term and can often be quite efficient. Um, to give you an example, suppose you're, you have a choice between targeting your existing customers or targeting non-customers or talking to both, talking to everyone in the category. What you find is that talking to non-customers tends to be somewhat inefficient for sort of direct responses. These are cold, cold prospects, if you like. They're the people least likely to respond to your communications. The more you move away from them to talking to your existing customers, the bigger the short-term responses you get. Talking to your existing customers, you're talking to people who are already warm prospects, people who've got a relationship with you, and they're more likely to respond to your emails and your mailings and your social media and so forth. So, it appears to be a very efficient thing to do. Focus on your existing customers, on your loyalists, all the things that Rachel suggested might not be the biggest money maker. Um, unfortunately, that's all it does. It gives you a short-term, immediate, efficient, direct response. But if you're interested in other things like increasing your market share, increasing your sales, increasing your profit, increasing your margins, then you want to go the other way. This chart, for example, shows the effect on top-line market share growth. And what we find is that targeting your existing customers is the least effective thing to do. It's better 
to talk to non-customers. Or even better, talk to customers and non-customers together, i.e. go for broad reach across the whole category. And this is true for a range of metrics. Basically, all the main effectiveness metrics get bigger the more you focus outward, go broad, talk to as many people as possible. The only thing that really works well with tight targeting in this case is that, that short-term direct response. So what we find is that targeting in this sense can increase efficiency, but, but for effectiveness, it's reach that really matters. And this is a consistent pattern. Um, one of our previous findings was about the role of emotion and about the role of fame. Now, um, we haven't talked about that so much today, um, but um, uh, I, I please see, again, Rachel sort of saying something very similar about the importance of getting an emotional response and how that tends to be more important than messaging in most contexts, depending on whether you're going for a um, long-term or a short-term effect. Um, and what we also found before was that um, when you can get not just an emotional response, but an emotional risk response at scale, when you can get a social effect, when you can get fame, um, the kind of thing that Mark spends a lot of his time looking at, then that's often where you get the biggest effects of all. And what we find in the new data is very similar patterns, that <laughs> rational messaging is by and large a fairly ineffective thing to do in most contexts, not always, but overall that um, getting an emotional response is much more important, particularly for brand building, than getting a message across. And if you can get people talking about the brand and talking about its marketing, then that's where you get the biggest response of all. And op that's often very closely related to getting an emotional response. Um, so uh, these things still seem to be important in the new data. Um, uh, and also, I, I, I was heartened to notice that um, the, the thing from Keller Fay about, uh, about the importance of fame in the real world as, as well as in the virtual world. But um, to our understanding that fame is not about just about getting a few shares or likes on social media. It's about creating ripples both online and offline um, and getting, getting pe people talking in the pub as well as on Facebook. And this, this is the kind of thing we see in the data is that the most effective campaigns are the ones that actually get real people talking everywhere. So emotions and fame are still important and we'll be doing more of that in, in a subsequent round of research that we've got planned. Um, but um, one of the uh, uh, things that people have talked about in the early days of social media, and I think this is becoming less common now, is the idea that um, you could just go viral. So um, I, I loved your dancing thing. I mean, this idea that, that all you need to do is to put a little bit of something out there, let it, let it ripple, let it go viral, and fame will somehow... Uh, generate itself. Just light the blue touch paper and retire, as we say about fireworks, you know. Um, so um, what we did, we, we looked at the role of earned and owned media within the IPA data and what they contribute to effectiveness. And what we found was that um, getting, having owned media, uh, so for example, hosting content on a brand's website or on YouTube, does significantly amplify the effectiveness of a marketing campaign. Getting earned media, getting people to share stuff and getting people to talk about stuff, also really has a significant effect on amplifying the effectiveness of advertising. But what they are is amplifiers. They don't tend to work on their own very well. And in particular, what we find with owned media, uh, earned media is most people don't get very much earned media. Um, and there are sp specific circumstances under which it's likely to happen. So this is um, a chart which shows the percentage of cases that actually generated significant amounts of earned media versus what they did. And these are the people who just decided to go viral. You know, They said, we're going to put something out there, and then we just let it fly. And the answer is 96% of the time, they fail. You know, the, yes, they're, they're, you know, every so often somebody will 
we'll have the uh, the latest. I mean, what was the last big viral thing? The, you know, the, the woman with the Chewbacca mask. You know, there will be. You know, every so often something like that will just take off. But for every sort of four people who have a success like that, there are 96 who get nothing. Um, actually, providing content that people can go to and look at, having the combination of owned media and earned media is slightly more effective, but still largely a failure. Um, what we find is that the, 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 the combination that works best is when you've got owned, earned, and paid all working together. You have great content which you put out there, you advertise the hell out of it, and then it will get shared and talked about. That's this one. And the, the people who actually put significant amounts of paid media behind their online content tend to be the ones that get that viral ampli amplification. Well, viral is probably the wrong word. Social amplification. Um, so, yes, you may get lucky and have a viral hit, but most people don't. And the only surefire, reliable route to success is to spend a shed load of money. And then if you can do that and, and you have great online content and you've got that stuff that's shareable, then you can make that money go f further. But there's no free lunch. Um, and more generally, what we find is that when we look at the effectiveness of paid versus unpaid activities online, it's the paid stuff that really works. Um, the free stuff works a bit, but it doesn't work nearly as well as the paid stuff. And the reason for that is really obvious. It's about reach again. Um, by and large, the stuff that's free doesn't reach many, many people. The only reliable way to get yourself in front of lots of people is to pay for it. And that's still true online as it was offline. So budgets still matter. And share of voice still matters. You're, you're no doubt all familiar with the old rule about the, the relationship between share of voice and market share. So the old model was that there was a, a sort of equilibrium relationship between a brand's share of voice and its share of market. If you set your share of voice below your share of market, then you will, all other things being equal, tend to lose market share over time. That's a recipe for failure. All other things being equal, and that's a big caveat. Um, and if you set your share of voice above market share, then you will, all other factors being equal, be likely to gain market share. Again, that's the old rule. But of course, what everyone says is, well, that can't be true anymore. It must be breaking down. Um, and what we've done is we've looked at the relationship over time. And actually, surprisingly, the relationship between share of voice, well, between growth and what we call excess share of voice, seems to have actually become tighter over time rather than looser. The correlation. Um, the R squared in, in, the, in, in the regression has actually got bigger over time. So what that tells us is that share of voice is not irrelevant. Share of voice is possibly, possibly more important than it used to be. And I think that relates to some stuff I'll t be telling you later on about, about, about these amplification effects. I think what's going on here is that the new media are amplifying the effects of, the, of paid share of voice. And so your paid share of voice matters even more now than it used to be. That's my hypothesis. I can't prove that. Um, again, another finding from our previous research is what we call the 60-40 rule. So the idea that to spend your money efficiently, you should probably spend about 60% of it on long-term brand building and about 40% of it on short-term activation. Um, it's a fairly rough rule, but it does seem to have held up very well over a long period of time and seems to be um, to work over quite a wide range of, of sectors. So what we've done is we've looked at, again, at that with the new data and also with some, some new methodologies that we've, some new data in the IPA data bank, which, which we didn't have before. Um, and what we found is it still seems to hold true at the aggregate level. So what we find is that the top performing campaigns all tend to have roughly a 60-40 balance. The most profitable, the best long-term growth, the biggest market share growth, the highest SOV efficiency. And that when you move away from the 60-40 allocation, either by having too much brand building, 
um, or too little brand building, then the efficiency with which the budget is used seems to decline. So there does, it does seem to be a fairly good relationship, at, at least at the aggregate level. And what Peter and I are doing at the moment is we're doing some new research to see whether this rule might vary by category or different marketing contexts. My guess is that it probably will to some extent. Um, um, and hopefully we'll be able to give you some more information that, on that um, in October. Um, but what we don't see so far is any significant changes over time. Um, it might be different, for example, if you're doing a brand launch or if you've got a product innovation. But my guess is that the rules are not changing over time. Um, now, as I say, efficient brand building means you, you need um, about 60% of your budget allocated to brand and about 40% allocated to short-term activation. And of course, what everybody says is, well, can't I do both? Can't I just have a, an ad that can do brand building and activation at the same time? Well, you can to some extent, um, but there is a tension between the two things. Um, and trying to do one may compromise your ability to do the, uh, the other. So brand building tends to be broad reach because you need to talk to people long before they come to buy. And that means that uh, you need to really think about anyone who might buy your brand over the next couple of years. Whereas sales activation works better when it's tightly targeted on the people who are likely to buy now. Brand building is Im primarily emotional, whereas there is a role for messaging in the short-term activation piece, and so on. So doing one well doesn't necessarily mean you'll do the other well. And what we see with it is we see this in, in the brand and activation effects by medium. So what we find is that media that are very good for short-term activation up at this end, um, like DRTV or, or inserts or SMS, text messages, uh, email, and so forth, don't tend to be so good at, for brand building. Uh, we've lost the bottom of the scale here, but this, these are brand building effects along the bottom, and these are activation effects along the y-axis. Whereas media that are good at brand building um, aren't necessarily so good at activation. So sponsorship is a nice example of a almost pure brand building medium. Um, great for brand building, but it's not, it's not going to get you the immediate clicks and likes and short-term sales. So what we find is there, is, there does tend to be a tension between the two. It's not, it's, it's not absolutely clear cut. So for example, one can use TV for either, but you use a different style of TV, you know, brand, brand, brand TV ads versus the sort of classic hard sell direct response TV. Um, it's not necessarily a, a feature of the medium as such, but of the, of, the, of the way the medium is used. So as I say, one of the features that determines the brand building, active, uh, the brand, brand building strength of a medium is the reach of that medium. Media with broad reach tend to be good for brand building. Um, and so I thought it's useful to look at the reach of different media um, as it exists at the moment. Now, I don't know the Australian market, but this is what the UK market looks like. So um, what we have here um, is, uh, on this axis, we have the weekly reach of each medium. Um, and on the x-axis, what we have is the um, average time spent consuming the medium uh, per day um, for, uh, for all adults. Um, conveniently, we've lost the, the titles here, so, I, I can, so you can't see what's going on. Um, so, uh, what comes out of this quite clearly is that people in the UK, at least, spend, t spend their leisure time doing two big things, and that is watching video and going online. Um, they spend, a, almost everybody in Britain does that, and almost everybody, on average, uh, and the average here is the mean, which is an important point, um, spend about four hours a day doing these things. Um, within that, um, most of the video is TV. And most of that TV is still broadcast TV. You know, TV produced by the traditional TV stations. And most of that is still watched on a TV set live. Um, so in the UK, 85% of all TV is still watched live on a TV set. Um, 
These figures are from um, October last year. I've seen the new figures for this year. They're, not, they're, they're still embargoed, but they look very, very similar. There's been a slight decline in broadcast TV viewing, but not very much. It's moved from about there to about there. Um, a lot of people find these, these figures surprising. Um, I don't, as I say, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but I do have seen the corresponding numbers for the US, and they're very similar, except for one thing, Americans watch more TV than we do. Um, TV is the main thing that people do with their leisure time, that and going online, often at the same time. Um, now, of course, what lots of people say, uh, in the UK anyway, is, well, of course, well, I don't do that. We don't watch TV at all anymore. We, we all watch Netflix. Um, Netflix is there. That's, that's Netflix. Subscriber video on demand. Um, uh, it's about a quarter of an hour a day on average. Um, it is growing, and it's growing quite fast. It's the fastest growing bit, but it's still actually quite small. Um, uh, now, I don't know how that fits with your view of the world. It often, certainly, people in London who spend their time hanging around in bars in Shoreditch, um, find this very surprising. Um, uh, that's because, A, they're not real people. Um, uh, B, they're not real people. people. Um, also, I think there are a number of other things. I, I, Netflix viewing is the kind of viewing that you remember, um, and you kind of forget the fact that you spend an immense amount of time watching other stuff like you know, dipping into Channel 4 News when you're just kind of eating your tea and um, bits of children's TV that you, you don't really remember watching but you were actually in the room. Um, the point is that if you want broad reach today, then you've got to be, have a presence online and you've got to have a, a video presence and TV is still going to be an important part of that video presence. Um, <clears throat> and so what we find is that within the new data that... TV is still the medium that produces the biggest advertising effects. It is still the medium, particularly, which produces the biggest effects on market share. Um, and within that, we looked at different kinds of TV. And what we find is that TV sponsorship is good for producing market share growth. DRTV is slightly better. But actually, good old-fashioned TV spot ads, you know, the kind of 30-second ads that everyone says um, are dead and irrelevant, turn out to still have the biggest effects on market share of all the different media we looked at. Um, but what we also find is that video is highly effective online. In fact, what we find generally is if you compare online activities that include video versus online activities that don't include video, that video is more effective. Um, and also, again, what we find is that paid is more effective than unpaid. So um, basically, Increasingly, what we see is that, particularly when you're doing brand building, the online activities that work best tend to, to look a lot like TV ads. Um, it was interesting in Karen's stuff there, when you talk about um, coverage and so on, the, the inexorable logic of that is, if you want to make your, TV, uh, your online video work better, it's just make it look more and more like TV ads. More of the screen, you know. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, b b maybe the future is actually quite old-fashioned. Um, um, look a lot like the past. But what we, what, we, what we do see is that online and offline video, TV and, and, and online video, work very well in synergy. So, um, and, and, and in fact, so here we've got uh, campaigns that use TV, campaigns that just use online video, which is looking at the effect on market share growth. And what we find is that um, while TV on its own is more effective than online on its, on its own, that when you've got the two working together, then you tend to get the best results of all. Um, and there'll be a number of reasons for that. One of, the, one of them is, again, incremental reach. Um, video, online video can give you additional reach with those like TV viewers. Um, and it also allows you to uh, it, do that online sharing thing. Um, if you've got, got people, people who want to share online content, then, then hosting it online is a good way, good way to do it. Um, and more generally, I think what we see is that there, there are synergies between 
online and offline media. Um, I, I liked your cream egg um, case study uh, where you showed that the effect of having social, and it was TV, wasn't it, together was bigger than the, the, the sum of the parts. Um, you actually see that with, for example, TV and, and DM or TV and point of sale. You get that thing where the effect of having the two together is about twice the, the sum of the individual effects. So synergy is really, really important. And what we believe is happening is that the, these synergies are making traditional media more effective. So what we find is if we look at, um, this is the effect of <coughs> the overall business effects of TV, press, radio, and outdoor. And the blue bars show the period from 98 to 2006. And the red bars show the periods from 2008 up to 2016. The data is biannual, which is why the funny, the data is funny. <laughs> what we find is that the overall effectiveness of each of these media seems to have increased over time. It's not what people are, uh, are saying. People are saying, of course, you know, TV doesn't work anymore. But in fact, TV has become more effective. Radio has become a lot more effective. Outdoor has become more effective, particularly recently since we've seen the arrival of digital outdoor. Um, and even press, which surely of all the media, traditional media, must be suffering the most, seems to have, have, have undergone a modest increase in effectiveness over time. And I believe the reason that, that, that this is happening is these synergies between online and offline. So in many ways, actually, the rules haven't changed that much. The new media haven't supplanted the old media. But what they're doing is they're all working together. And if you get it right, all of this stuff can work better than it ever used to. But not all of these rules, the, rule, the unchanging rules, they're not necessarily being followed. Um, and so I've done the good cop bit, and <laughs> Peter will now tell you the bad news. OK, so are the rules being followed? It's a dumb question. Would I be standing here now <coughs> telling you everything's per? You know me better than that. You know, I love a good rant. So let's have a good rant. The answer, of course, is no. We've been hopelessly seduced by a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about. We've been seduced by short-termism. We've been seduced by a lot of bad behaviors that come with it. So let me just start with, with short-termism. And just to reiterate what we've been saying, we, we, we said four years ago, we repeat it now, that it is vital to effectiveness to develop campaigns that can drive long-term effects, can drive these long-term memory structures and associations. You have to be in market long enough to do them. A simple, single, short-term initiative, no matter how sexy and creative it is, can create these embedded and enduring behavioral changes without exposure over time, in market, without the reinforcement effect that we showed. So when you see a chart like this, and remember this is supposedly the creme de la creme of global marketing, that all of these case studies submitted from around the world into the IPA data bank. What we found is from a long-term running average of about 7 or 8%, which, which was the case for most of the last 36 years, suddenly, really since the onset of the global financial crisis, has exploded. So on a 10-year average rolling basis, it's gone from about 7 or 8% to just over a quarter. And if we took a more recent snapshot, it would be rather near closer to a half. So this is really dangerous development. It means enormous numbers of marketers are deluding themselves that they can drive enduring success with these very short-term kinds of initiatives, whether they are essentially promotionally driven or whether they are just about uh, short-term behavioral prompts. They simply do not have the same market effect. So let me just show you how that plays with some UK data. What it has driven is an explosion of investment behind the kinds of media channels that are particularly powerful at sales activation. And Les has teed this up. So looking at this chart, this is done by Ender's analysis. I could show you the IPA data, but it's, it's very, very similar to this, but in fact not as, as authoritative. So the Ender's analysis do this vast analysis from time to time. It seems to take them at least a decade to recover from the last one before they do the next one, where they, they put uh, UK media expansion into two buckets. Their language display, our language brand building, their language direct response, our language activation. That's essentially the same model. And back in the year 2000, when we would argue sanity prevailed more powerfully than it does now, it was about a 60-40 split. It was pretty much at the sweet spot. Um, and at that time, effectiveness was improving, and we were still marching ever forward to P 
peak effectiveness, which I will come back to later. This is what's happened in the uh, intervening period. So this is their last analysis from 2016, which they published earlier this year. And you can see what's happened. We've moved essentially now to a 50-50 division between brand building and activation. And bear in mind, uh, less than my sweet spot of 60-40. So we've gone way beyond the sweet spot. If you think about this in money terms, this represents billions, literally billions of pounds that has been pulled out of long-term brand building, creating these memory associations and put into short-term sales activation. Billions of pounds. The same's happening here. The same's happening everywhere we go. Billions coming out of brand building, billions into just that last-minute bidding war for the attention of consumers. However cleverly directed it is through big data or whatever, it's essentially what it often boils down to. I could show you some UK data for what's going on. The primary driver of that is, of course, paid search, because that is used to deliver so much of this. I'm going to give you the Australian things. The UK chart looks exactly the same. The New Zealand chart looks exactly the same. The Canadian chart looks exactly the same. The US chart looks exactly the bloody same. Wherever you go in the world, we are pulling billions out of the brand building for long-term growth in order to fund this obsession, this addiction to short-term sales activation because we think it's cool and we think this is the way to drive long-term growth. It's a huge mistake. It is a huge mistake. So we're not anti-search. Paid search has been the founding st one of the founding stones of the improvements to efficiency and effective effectiveness that we observed earlier on in this millennium. But we've just gone too far. We're putting too much money into it. And the money to fund 25% year-on-year growth in Australia, 20% year-on-year growth in the UK. It's got to come from somewhere. It's not coming from Father Christmas. <laughs> it's coming from brand-building budgets. And I know this because a lot of the clients I work with tell me this is what's happening. CFO, phone, I'm raiding your marketing budget. Search works. Powerful. And this is happening time and time again. So we, ha we have to push back against this if we want to... Uh, to address what's going on. So how can, I, how can I really prove to you, and it's difficult to prove that it is an obsession with short-term sales activation effects that is essentially the key problem. If I can do it in one chart, I'll do it, and this is lots of other data in, in the report that you can look at, but if there's one chart that I think kind of proves it, it's this. The one metric, the one metric that has improved over this period of time, because it's pretty depressing reading, otherwise most of the metrics have been going deeply south, there's one metric that has improved at this time. It's our ability to drive these short-term sales activation effects because that's where all the time and all the money and all the thinking and all the gizmos and widgets and everything else, that's where all the energy has gone. So we're doing better at it. Not massively, but we are at least doing better at something. Now, I could show you a dozen different brand metrics and some that are perhaps more closely related to mental availability, which I hugely uh, approve as a, as, as a uh, measure, as a metric. But I'm just going to use one, brand awareness, which I suppose applies to most brands at some level. Uh, and, but also, it's actually one of the less terrifying ones. There are some brand metrics that are, frankly, falling through the floor at the moment in the sense of our ability to support and drive them. And what we see is a relentless slide in this particular metric. Like I say, peak brand building occurred at the onset of the global financial crisis about 2008. That was when we generated the biggest impact on brand measures since then. They've pretty much all been in free fall. So what this tells me, very, very simplistically, is that we are disinvesting in the defense and the building of our brands, the creation of these powerful mental associations that will drive long-term growth in order to feed our addiction to short-term effects. And we're doing it on a very big scale. Okay, so that's one issue. Um, Les has talked about tight targeting and how um, targeting at existing customers is a pretty dopey thing to do. So, uh, and we've seen in the IPA data bank, indeed, a real shift away from that kind of loyalty market, at least amongst the effectiveness case studies that go into it. So it's a biased sample. Effectiveness case studies spend less and less of their money on loyalty marketing. That's a key finding in itself. But we, so we've seen a lot less of that. Ah, but it's not the way we do tight targeting anymore. The world has moved on, people tell us. The way we do it now is we use people's digital trails to identify when they are about to make a purchase. And then and only then do we serve our advertising message at them. And surely that has got to be massively more efficient. There's no waste in that. We know they're about to buy, serve them the message through social or perhaps search um, big databases and uh, bingo. So we'll test drive that as well. We'll test drive it in the same way we test drive um, 
uh, loyalty marketing by comparing how it plays out over time uh, with short and long-term metrics. And we can do this because about 40% of the case studies submitted to this database over the last four years have, have done precisely this. They have used big data to drive this kind of, these kinds of short-term sales activation marketing, real-time real marketing. So uh, let's test drive it. Let's look at short-term effects. Same picture. Clearly, big data used as a tool for real-time marketing is a massive enhancer, a uh, turbocharge of our ability to drive these short-term sales effects. Doubles our chances of succeeding it. Much even better than targeting existing customers. So let's not take anything away from it. This is a great new tool for generating short-term sales activation effects, but only short-term sales activation effects used in this way. Come back to that in a moment. Um, you know what's coming. The inevitable consequence of pulling money out of long-term brand building, creating powerful mental associations in order simply to serve last-minute advertising messages to people in the market right now is we reduce the capacity for long-term growth. We weaken our long-term metrics. Um, in this case, we're looking at market share growth. We could look at any of the others. It's all the same. Now, of course, big data doesn't have to be used to drive real-time marketing in this way. It can be used as a tool for strategy. Um, we'll be reporting on this later, but it has very, very different impacts on long-term success used in different ways. I'm picking out a very particular way here. So again, we have to be, we have to be wary about the benefits of big data as a, um, a guiding principle for our marketing. Fortunately, we none of us have to make this mistake again because the guys at Procter & Gamble have done it for us and they've been very, very public about the disastrous mistake that the 2014-15 Facebook experiment was for those brands. Um, Mark Pritchard said we targeted too much, we went too narrow, and he interestingly went on to say the bigger your brand, the more you need broad reach and less targeted media. I begin to think someone from Ehrenberg Bass might have been getting to him <laughs> on that. But of course, he's absolutely right. He makes an interesting point. We may well be the case that if you're a niche player, perhaps in a tech category, it may well be that we can get away with other rules here. But if you are in any way a mainstream brand in an established category, the rules have not changed, but a lot of people have been led to believe that they have. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, he may have been in high school, but he hasn't often done a lot of damage from high school. Um, now, look, the last point, and this, again, is going to be heretical. This is something that Les and I get really quite concerned about because this is, I mean, it's not a new force in marketing, but it is a massively growing force. And a lot of the clients we work with will tell you that they are driven by ROI. They will not cross the road unless the ROI is going to make it advantageous to them. And we're very, very concerned about the impact that's having. It's, it's amplifying many of the negative factors that we're seeing and feeding this frenzy of short-termism and all the bad behaviors that go with it. So let me just play with this for a moment. Rum, how could it possibly be that ROI is a dangerous metric? Well, this, I'm going to build this in two parts. If we are chasing maximum ROI, what we're going to do is we're going to go for the low-hanging fruit in the market. We're going to do the sales activation piece. We're going to serve our advertising messages only to people who we're pretty sure are in the market now. The easy targets, we're going to do that very efficiently at low cost because we can use the data to do, us, to do it. And we will achieve very, very large returns on investment. Because return on investment, of course, is the ratio of what we get out, profit terms, for the cost of what we put in. So if by reducing the amount of money we spend on it and still maintaining some kind of adequate response, uh, we, we, we will be able to re increase our ROI. So we more or less double it. Long-term case studies, because they are not doing that, they are doing the difficult thing. They are building mental associations to drive long-term sales. They're going to make next year's sales targets easier to achieve than this year's was because these great mental associations last for years, if not decades, but they don't deliver the full fruits of their, of their potential in a quarter or in the kinds of time spans that these ROIs are measured. So if you want to max out ROI, go short term. Don't bother with the brand building piece. Don't worry about that. Just do all of this low-hanging fruit stuff. Here's the problem, though, because if you want to drive long-term profit growth, if you want to drive profit growth full stop, you have to be in for the long-term game. You have to be trying to drive incremental sales over the long term. You have to be worried about next year's sales targets. But also, these case studies have bigger, much bigger impacts on pricing. So you end up driving additional volume at additional margin, 
And you don't need to be an accountant to realize that that's pretty much the uh, magic wand for profitability. So if you want to be profitable, you need to develop these long-term uh, brand ideas, these long-term associations. Now, hang on, you might be saying, how can that be? Big ROI, low profit, low ROI, big profit. that doesn't make sense. So, okay, so get your spectacles out, because this is a horrid chart, and I apologize in, in advance. These are the correlations of various metrics that we use with profit, the profit metric. And you can see in there, all, actually, you can't see on the bottom, the bold ones are all significant at the 99% level, very, 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 very strong uh, significance. You can see in all of these metrics, all of the, the, um, the key metrics that we use every day, sales growth, market share growth, price elasticity <coughs> effects, loyalty penetration, all of those metrics correlate really very strongly with profit growth. So too does the number of brand effects. That's the extent to which we are strengthening brands. So if you want to build long-term profitability, this data tells you very strongly you need to be strengthening the brand. If you're not strengthening the brand, you are very much less likely to drive profitability. At the very bottom of the pile, but still correlated, but much weaker, are very large activation effects, these short-term effects, because of course they are about extracting benefit now from brand building, so they do have an effect. And then uh, only um, significant at a slightly lower level is the actual ROI itself. So it is the least effective of those metrics. Now, okay, so, that's, so maybe ROI isn't a brilliant metric, but this doesn't say it's disastrous. The disastrous bit comes in this. So if we seek ROI, if we're looking to drive ROI, this is what we end up doing. There is only one metric there that correlates really strongly with ROI at the topmost level and with a respectable level, and that is these short-term activation effects. That's all we're going to end up doing, going for low-hanging fruit in the market, trying to drive a quick sale for people who would probably have bought the product anyway later. It's going to look very sexy because maybe we've brought it forward. Um, Profit, we've already seen that metric. All of the metrics that we know are so important to long-term growth, share and so on and so forth, pricing, all of those don't correlate significantly. And most worryingly of, of all, the metric that our colleagues at Ehrenberg Bass will teach us is perhaps the most vital uh, to long-term growth is our ability to bring consumers into the brand to drive penetration growth. If anything, it negatively correlates with ROI. It couldn't be more dangerous because if we chase ROI we're going to abandon all the stuff that matters in the long term and this is happening this is happening we think it's partly behind it can't you can't explain it only but it's partly behind why many of these very effectiveness orientated case studies have been in in um, relentless uh, kind of downward trend on budgets there's been a real decline in the typical levels of extra share of voice difference between share of voice and share of market, the primary driver of growth in budgeting terms. There's been a relentless decline uh, in the kinds of budgets we've going. There are lots of factors in there, but as we have said, clearly um, ROI is, a, is becoming an increasing factor in that. So where does this all add up? And I talked about peak effectiveness. So this is 10-year aggregated data. There's about 200 case studies in each of those data points. Um, but the downside of aggregating data in that way is it apparently it lags the apparent, the apparent peak point because we're rolling data up. Peak effectiveness was reached as we went into uh, the global financial crisis around about 2006, 2007. Um, uh, but since then, this is what's happened. And we've never seen anything like this. We've never seen a six-year consistent trend in declining effectiveness. We've had recessions in the UK in the past. We had loads of them. We're really good at recessions. Um, but <laughs> we've never seen anything like this. And you can't blame this all on recession. This is a changing, this is all of the things that go with short-termism. Obsession with tight targeting, obsession with chasing low-hanging fruit, uh, reduction in budget, obsession with ROI. These things all feed and feed off one another. And we have essentially thrown away all of the fantastic advantages that Les has been talking about that we so painstakingly built up and learned over the early years of the millennium. We've thrown the goddamn lot away. We're back, essentially, in the average effectiveness terms at where we were um, pretty much at the start of the millennium. Not a great scorecard. Not a great scorecard. But it's completely avoidable. None of this need happen if we just learnt and followed the rules, the empirical rules that come from Ehrenberg Bass and Karen Nelson Field and our own work. If people just followed the rules, Stop being sidetracked by 
the latest trend, the latest gizmo, the latest piece of unfounded theory, then this is completely avoidable, believe me. Okay, so obvious conclusions. We need to really get back to a much more balanced perspective on long versus short-term objectives and stop chasing the low-hanging fruit because it doesn't drive long-term fruit. We must get back to appreciating the importance of broad reach and stop doing Procter & Gamble. Type. If Procter & Gamble in 2014 can have been misled, we can all have been misled by that. We must, we must remember the importance of broad reach. Um, and we've got to get this pendulum, the brand building activation pendulum, which I've suggested to you has won, swung wildly beyond the sweet spot to 50-50 or beyond, frankly. We need to bring that back much closer to the 60-40 sweet spot which seems to work across most categories. Um, we need to remember that ultimately growth is related to the investment. We need to still remember that investing in share of voice is vital. But doing that will mean putting more money into brand building, not yet more, into the bottomless pit of sales activation, the bidding war for that last microsecond of someone's attention. Uh, and of course, as Les has pointed out, this means valuing video over non-video. Video is a huge... Um, uh, hugely more effective medium because of its power to convey emotions uh, as well as its reach because we love video. Uh, and then lastly, but by no means least, we need to get back to designing campaigns, that is to say those emotional, famous and highly creative campaigns that are capable of driving long-term effects and stop producing the kinds of activities. We haven't shown you examples of this, but the kinds of activities that are only really geared to short-term behavioral response. I'm not going to talk about the impact of short-termism now on creativity because this is not the time, and frankly, it's too frigging grisly to talk about <laughs> it. But at some point, we will report on it. It's, it's massacring everything that is brilliant uh, in the sense of effectiveness. Uh, look, thank you very much for listening to us.